So as we dive into Acts chapter 12 today, there are two, I would say, like diametrically opposed themes that emerge from this chapter for me. And uh, the one is the very real strain uh, that is on the new covenant that the church is being shaped. When Jesus was teaching, he said, you don't pour new wine into an old wineskin because the old wineskin has become hard and brittle and the new wine with its vigor will actually burst it and you lose both the wineskin and the wine. And that parable he was talking about is the a precise picture of what's going on in the book of Acts. What we have is an old wineskin and, an, and the new wine of the new covenant in Christ. And so, so the early Christianity is straining as the new wine, and it's stressing the old wineskin. So with uh, its acceptance, with Christianity's acceptance of the conversions in, of the half-Jews, first of all, in Samaria, and then the Gentile household of Cornelius, and then of the hardly connected at all Christians that were coming to Christ in Antioch that we've just been talking about, and that is so loose. The Jerusalem church was feeling tremendous pressure on its forms, on its traditions, on the things that God had given. Remember that all the time and read the scriptures with grace for the, for the Jewish people because they were holding to the word that God had given and it was truly a supernatural revelation. So they were in a really difficult place and I think we can have compassion on them. But it was stressing them to the breaking point. There was no room left within Jewish Christianity and Jewish traditions for the Christian mission to the Gentile world. There just wasn't a way to make these two things fit. And so before Luke gives us an account of how Christ is going to advance into the Gentile world through the Apostle Paul, who is, is about to emerge but hasn't quite gotten there yet, uh, and Luke is going to talk to us in this chapter about how God is continuing to work in the, in the Jewish church, in the, among, among the Jews of Christian uh, faith. Gentile action is complementary. Everyone say complementary, not contradictory. It would be very easy for the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians to start their own denominations. How many of you have seen this in your lifetime? The beginning of a denomination. It usually comes about because of division because we're not quite the same. And so, so there, there was just tremendous pressure. And, and I think it's important to realize that the Gentile action of God in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, is going to be complementary and run alongside of what he's doing in the Jewish church. I think it's something that we as modern Christians would do well to remember, that, that we are complementary to one another. The second theme, though, that's unfolding is the kingdom is happening in mostly pretty normal people like you and I. So just take a look beside you and go, hmm, <laughs> they could have been in the book of Acts. And I think maybe you will see yourself potentially in the book of Acts this morning through some very human, human people. And I can identify with so many of them. So I'm going to ask God to show you uh, elements of your faith journey uh, that are happening to, I, I think we, we kind of have this uh, almost an idolatry of the early church, like, oh, they were so, oh, they had it so together, they understood it. No, they didn't. You, this chapter is going to show us something completely different. And so lest you fear that you or the people near you are a little dense <clears throat> and maybe aren't quite getting it, I'd like to say, and I'd like you to turn to your neighbor and say, there's hope for you. There's hope for you. All right? So we jump into verse 1. Luke starts, now about this time. And this is an interesting phrase, and it just, it just bears, because there's a lesson here that has to do with many things in the Scripture. There are people who go through the text and say, well, the Bible's wrong. It's got the chronology wrong. It's, it's got this wrong. It's got and they cast doubt on, on the validity of Scripture. But this is going to be an example of how the Bible is written in a little bit different way than sometimes we would read it. Greek thinking places a very high priority on chronology, right? On the literal time stamp of the way things are unfolding. In Luke's mind, he doesn't say uh, before or after. He says about the time. And he's doing that for a very specific reason. 
Uh, and so just, just to make the point, the famine that was prophesied by Agabus, do you remember at the la- end of the last chapter, Agabus prophesies a famine is going to come over the, the land, and so they take up that big offering, uh, and they begin to collect that fund. Well, that famine, there was a great famine that occurred about 46 AD. However, the text we're about to read uh, King uh, Herod Agrippa, who is a main character in this chapter, died about 44 AD. And so, so did, did the biblical writer get this wrong? Did he not get the time right? Well, if it's inspired, how can it be wrong, right? So, so the ancient historians, though, often group their materials in something called per species. So in other words, they dealt with topics more than they dealt with chronologies. They wanted to lay out everything that was connected with that story, and then they'd go back and lay out and grab a whole story and tell that story. And that was kind of the way they did it. So Luke has finished now the Antioch thread that we were talking about last time, which was, by the way, happening concurrently with what was going on with Peter in Caesarea at Cornelius' house. So this is all convoluted. It doesn't fit a timeline neat and tidy like we would maybe like it to, like we would like it to read. We'd like it to read like a history book where this happened and that happened and then that happened and then that happened. And as a result of this, this happened. It's not that simple when you're reading Old Testament history or New Testament historians. So Luke now reaches back to Peter. And if Luke was building Acts around a strict chronology, Acts 12 would fall between the church plant in Antioch of Acts 11, 19 to 26, and then the Agabus prophecy in Acts 11, 27 to 30. So this was happening kind of in that time slot. And so that's why he says about this time. Now let me introduce you to a soap opera. This is a soap opera, and this is about King Herod Agrippa. He was born in 10 BC. He was the son of Aristobulus, a grandson of Herod the Great, the king. And, and, uh, and his wife, his grandmother, was a Hasmonean has, uh, princess. And that's important because if you remember when the Jews rebelled and cast off Rome, that empire was called the Hasmonean Empire. And so they were kind of like, they were super, super people, right? And they were highly regarded. Now, after his father's execution, Herod Agrippa, uh, which was in 7 BC, so he's about three years old, his grandfather sends him with his mother Bernice to Rome. And there he grows up in intimate friendships with some members of the Roman imperial family, especially Gaius, who is the grandnephew of Emperor Tiberius, and then a rising star in Rome politics, a guy named Caligula. Anybody heard of Caligula? Yeah, the man was insane. He, went, he was insane and he ruled the Roman Empire, so whatever. Uh, but Herod himself, in being in this privileged position, he's kind of like a spoiled, rich, socialite kid. Uh, and he's got every privilege. And so he's known kind of as a playboy. But that loose lifestyle led him to extravagance, and he would wind up piling up piles of debt. And he actually has to leave the country in order to get away from his creditors. So this guy's going to be king, by the way. So, you know, this is just his background. Um, Tiberius, uh, oh, I'm sorry. So he was allowed to return some years later, um, but he managed to offend the family that he had become quite close to, the family of Emperor Tiberius. And so he winds up getting thrown in jail anyway. Well, it's not very long. And by the way, the shelf life of Roman politicians at the top of the heap is relatively short. I just like to say, many people aspire to power I'm not so sure it's such a good idea in Rome. These guys get whacked on a regular basis. And so Tiberius dies about 37 AD, and Emperor Caligula rises to power. Well, that was Herod's buddy. And Caligula releases him and gives him a kingdom and names him a king. So he goes from jail to being a king. How about that? Uh, He becomes the king over the Palestinian tetrarchies. Now, uh, uh, the tetrarchs were, uh, essentially it means ruler of a quarter. Do you remember the Greek empire and how it was divided? It was divided and and quartered. So that's kind of what this was. So one of those quarters, he's he's given. So Herod Antipas, um, who was a relative, an uncle over Herod Agrippa, Uh, By the way, his uncle, Herod, was the one who had John the Baptist beheaded and also the one to whom Pilate sent Jesus. He sent him back to to that king. And uh, so these guys are related. And so 
Uh, Herod Antipas, though, gets banished because of all the drama that's going on in Rome. You're probably wondering what this has to do with anything, but don't worry, we'll get there. How many of you like soap operas? Yeah. All right. So, so he's banished by Gaius, who was one of those childhood friends of Herod uh, uh, Agrippa. Uh, he, is, he is banished to Europe because Herod Agrippa had told the emperor Gaius that his uncle, who, by the way, was the one who paid his debts to the creditors, he now turns on him and says he's been involved in a conspiracy against Rome. And so Herod is shipped off to Europe, and guess who's put in, play, put in power? So here now we have Herod Agrippa in power. And as he gets there in A.D. 39, Agrippa also is given Galilee and Perea. And so in Luke chapter 3, if you are reading that, you will notice all of these names and all of these territories. This is all the people that Herod Agrippa is involved with. So Claudius, because Gaius is assassinated, so there goes his childhood buddy and his guy in friendship and power, but Claudius is made emperor in A.D. 41. And so he gives Judea and Samaria also to Agrippa, which means now that kind of the old kingdom has been put back together. And the Jewish people are getting kind of excited as they're watching this territory of their ancient lands all coming together under King Herod Agrippa. And so he had become a powerful ruler by now. And, uh, and now the Herods traditionally had not been very popular. They were not really loved by the masses. But Herod Agrippa is a shrewd politician, and so he is going to figure out how to change the fortunes and, and his reputation among the Jewish people that are largely the people of his domain. And so it was said of, of Agrippa that in Rome, he was a cosmopolitan Roman. <laughs> However, when he was in Jerusalem, he was a pious Jew. Does that surprise anybody? that a good politician knows how to behave depending on who he's with. I'm not saying that about all politicians because some of them are very honorable. But there is an element of appealing to the people who put you in power. Many of you think that being a politician would be a tremendous challenge. Yeah, I, I just, I, I, wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to try. Uh, but the, so, so, so we're learning a little bit now about Agrippa. Agrippa's going to change the mind, try to change the mind of people. And so... Uh, Jewish historians would say that the king Agrippa was guided by his wife, the queen, who, by the way, was a very powerful woman, who was the one who actually got him out of a lot of trouble in his young life. But they said the queen is guided by Gamaliel. How many of you remember the name Gamaliel? Do you remember Acts 5, the, the leader in the Sanhedrin who said, be careful what you do with these men lest you be found fighting against God? So you can hear how this is all related together how these people all knew each other. These are the people in power. And so during festival uh, pilgrimage processions, bearing the baskets of the fruits, the people would come in bearing the first fruits offerings and they bring them into the temple. It was said that even King Agrippa would put a basket up on his shoulder and bring it as far into the temple as he was allowed to bring it. And so, so they'd see him being this pious uh, Jew. And during the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, Agrippa was given Deuteronomy 17. And so this is coming to us from the Mishnah, which is, by the way, the written record of the oral traditions that was recorded in the second century. These were the oral traditions of the Jewish leadership. And so they, they just recorded it. But here's what they recorded about Agrippa. Agrippa received the text Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 20, to read in public to the pilgrims, pilgrims as they assembled. And it says, King Agrippa received it standing, and he read it standing. Now, when the Roman dignitaries would come, they had to be part of this stuff, and they'd be like, oh, hum, and they'd get it, they'd plop it in front of them, and they'd read it. But, but that was disrespectful. Agrippa would stand in honor of the word of God, and the scribes and the Pharisees loved that. So here he was, endear he knew how the system worked, he knew how to endear himself uh, to the people. It says, when he reached the part that says, thou mayest not put a foreigner over thee, which is not thy brother. It said of him that his eyes flowed with tears because he had Edomite ancestry. However, as he wept, as he read that passage, it says that the crowd called out to him, you are our brother, you are our brother. 
And so you could tell he was winning the hearts of the people by his involvement with them. This was all the response of a grateful nation because he was a politician and he did advocate for his place uh, and for the place of the Jewish people of his territories. In 40 AD, he persuaded the insane Caligula not to erect a statue of himself proclaiming himself God in the middle of Jerusalem's temple. Well, that was a good, that was, would have been a bad move, but I mean, what did Caligula know? He was insane. Um, but, but Agrippa talked him out of it, and so, and so the Jewish people appreciated that. And he also advocated for humane treatment of the Jews in Alexandria, which endeared him some more. And when Judea came under his jurisdiction, he actually moved the capital from Caesarea to Jerusalem. And so, of course, he's doing these things because he has intentions. He wants to be popular. Now, the apostles, if you remember, after Pentecost, in, uh, enjoyed a lot of protection because of their popularity. They were doing miracles. People were being healed. There was dramatic things. And so they were held in such high favor that nobody dared to touch the apostles. However, uh, to quote a line uh, out of a movie, the, the mob is fickle, brother. <laughs> the mob is fickle. And by the time Herod Agrippa arrives on the scene, as we read into the text, as we now follow into the verses that come, it says, Herod laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he found out that that pleased the Jews. He was laying hands on the Christians and mistreating them. And then he goes as far as to behead James. James is one of the apostles. You remember the three in the inner circle of Jesus? Peter, James, and John. The first of the inner circle has just been martyred for the cause of Christ. And when he sees that that goes really well, he decides to arrest Peter as well. He's going to go after all of them now because the Jews, this gives him favor. Herod's policy was to secure the support of the majority of the people in his lands. And in doing that, he would ruthlessly oppress anyone who was a minority. To him, Jewish Christianity was a force of disruption. You remember all of those scenes that were happening in the temple and arrests and all of those trials and all those sorts of things? Herod did not like any of that. He wanted peace and tranquility, stability of his rule. And so he would help the Jewish leadership attack the Christians to get rid of them. And so he started by arresting leaders and he, of course, would behead James. He was being very clear with Christianity in its embryonic state that if you associate yourself with Jesus of Nazareth, this is what you can expect. This is what I will do to you. And this will be your lot. So with one sentence, the first of Jesus' inner three disappears from history. Servant of God is gone. The manner of death reminds me of when you see on the news uh, the beheadings of Christians who are caught evangelizing in Muslim countries. It's done to create Fear is done to intimidate. And that's exactly what kind of guy Herod Agrippa was. Eusebius, the Greek historian of Christianity, wrote that the officer who was charged with the incarceration of James was so impressed by James that by the time he came to his execution, the guard professed Christ. And he was beheaded right alongside of James. Now that's faith. What kind of an influence, what kind of work did the Spirit of God do through James in that one guard? One last soul into the kingdom before he would go to his reward. In verse 3, we see Herod observing political expedience of it, and he arrests Peter during the Passover, but he's not going to kill him during the Passover, and so he's going to hold him in prison. And uh, it's interesting because he arrests him during the Passover, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread was a time when they would eat the kind of food that they ate in the wilderness as they were being delivered from the tyrant Pharaoh, who was a demigod in his own right. And so here now is Herod Agrippa professing to be a pious Jew who has become exactly the same kind of leader that Pharaoh was as they're celebrating the exit from Egypt. And it's the, I mean, it's just so ironic, and he can't see what he's doing. In verse 4, we realize that he intends to make a spectacle of Peter after the festival, and so he sends a strong message. Four squads of soldiers are on duty to make it clear there will be no rescues. 
this time. I wonder if he had heard about what happened when the temple guards tried to put Peter in jail. He'd been sprung twice already before. And so that was not going to happen under, under Herod's watch. So four squads of soldiers, each would have at least two of them chained with Peter in the cell. So imagine that. Imagine eating. Imagine trying to sleep. Imagine trying to go to the bathroom. I mean, I'm just trying to put myself in Peter's shoes. Can you imagine anything worse than going through a day chained to anybody? That's why I never liked the expression, the old ball and chain. <laughs> I don't think we have any understanding of what it would be like to be chained especially to a Roman guard. So here he is, he's in jail, and there's two more guards at the door, and there's the other squads that are off duty. They're there in the prison as well. There's plenty of people to make sure that Peter stays put. Can I ask you this morning, who is your Herod? (laughs) Who is the person that goes after you? Who's the person that torments you? Who are the people that you've had in your life? How many of you have had a Herod in your life at some point? Who's had a Herod? They picked on you. They pushed you. They tried to push your buttons. They leveraged you. They used their power to intimidate and control you, to take advantage of you. Who's had a Herod? Who loves their Herod? Yeah. I've had Herods. I'm still trying to arrive at that level of faith where I can truly love them. The best I can do right now is ignore them and tolerate them. I'm doing my best. And so... But what's going on? What's going on while this is all happening? Well, enter verse 5 and meet the good guys. In James 5, 16, it says, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And so it tells us that the church of Jerusalem goes into spiritual warfare, raising an intercession to the high king of heaven to trump the ruling of the low king on earth. Herod's delight is in that this will be the last night for Peter on planet Earth. And maybe even a little bit of pride that he's going to do what nobody else could do. He's going to stamp out this Christianity thing once and for all. And so he's going right after the leader. However, his joy is short-lived. The Jerusalem Christians had no illusions about Herod's intentions, and so they were praying like there was no tomorrow because for Peter, there was not going to be a tomorrow. But while the the world has Herods in it, as you and I go through this journey, I want you to remember what Peter knows. The world has Herods, but you have Jesus. The world has Herods. In this world, you will have trouble, but do not fear. I have overcome the world. And so here is, is Peter. The church is praying. And in verse 6, this is like something out of a Marvel movie. <laughs> What's about to happen? I, it would be so cool to have a super like studio actually do this story. This would be dramatic. So, so Peter is anticipating his execution. He's been chained between guards for seven days. And, uh, and it, it mentions nothing, by the way, of any charges that are brought against him. This is just Herod's going to get him because of who he is. And so how is Peter doing in this cell? Is he stressed out? Is he scared? Is he crying out to God in fear? No. Actually, he's sleeping. (laughs) Sleeping. If you can imagine. I don't know. Would you be sleeping on your last night on planet Earth before your execution the next day? I don't think I would be. So how can Peter be sleeping? I think it's because Peter knows what we try to know and wish we could know in a better way. Who here wishes you could really see God in all of his glory and all of his power, so that you would know for sure you have nothing to worry about. We worshiped it this morning, that we want to see Jesus more clearly. And I think he is sleeping the sleep of a man with a clear conscience, an obedient faith, and an absolute confidence that whatever God decides concerning him is going to be just fine. He's either the next day going to die and go to eternity, or he's going to live and then every day have to die to himself in order to build a kingdom for eternity's sake before he goes to eternity. It doesn't matter. He has a kingdom perspective. He's not worried about which way this is going to go. He's going to live his life for Jesus, and he's not worried about how it's going to go. So in verse 7 and 8, in Luke's language, it says the angel of the Lord. Luke uses this term when he's talking about God coming and intervening in the affairs of men. This is probably a, a, a theophany. This is God appearing in the cell. And, and so the angel of the Lord beams into the cell, and he's glowing like a nightlight. It says there's light everywhere. 
And this is reminiscent of Luke's language. Do you remember when, when the heavenly host came and the glory of the Lord shone around about them and they were so afraid? He's using the same language as he did then. By the way, Luke wrote that portion of Scripture as well, right? So Peter is sleeping like a rock. Oh, come on. That was funny. Ah, there you go. Good morning. And so the angel has to whack him with a stick in order to wake him up. And, uh, and he says, get up, gird yourself, get your sandals on, we're going for a walk. Oh, and by the way, don't forget your coat. Oh, yeah, right, okay, I got my coat. Uh, and Peter's about to remind the angel, hey, I can't leave because of, and, he, and the shackles fall off his wrist, just like that. Just, I mean, isn't that something out of a Marvel movie? Like, like th- shackles don't just open up and fall off. You know, there's keys and there's locks and they're in the guard. And, he, and by the way, what are the guards doing? Who knows? Are they sleeping? I'm going to suggest not likely. Guards who fell asleep on duty were executed. I don't think they were sleeping. So this is really amazing. Now, in verse 9, we realize, and here's some of the humanity of this story. Peter's thinking, this is such an awesome dream. I love this dream. I love this dream. Wouldn't it be cool if that really happened? I don't know what he's thinking, but like, have your dreams ever felt real to you? Who here has like very realistic dreams? Sharon said I was thrashing around the other night. She goes, what scared you? Apparently I like jumped and did a 180 in the air and flopped onto the bed the other way. And I just like to say for the record, it was an ugly kind of eel with no eyes and a mouth like this with big fang teeth. That's what I was dreaming about. And apparently I jumped in bed. That felt pretty real. Not relevant to anything. That right there is why sermons get long. That's exactly why sermons get long. So the handcuffs fall off, and he's thinking he's in a dream. But he'd had one of those before. Remember when he was in the trance and he was on the rooftop, and the Spirit of God, uh, the angel of the Lord, led him and told him where to go, to go to Caesarea, to Simon the Tanner's house. So he's going, okay, we're having another one of those. That's cool. And he's dreaming all of this stuff. I wonder if Peter recognized the angel. I wonder if it was the same angel. I wonder if he said, oh, hi, it's you again. What was your name? I had a friend in Bible school who, oh, I'm doing it again. This is another reason sermons get long. I had a Bible school friend, his name was Rob, and he met an angel in his office named Henry. Henry, the angel. Does that sound right to you? I I just, like it should be, like Adonai, or you know, some some spiritual sounding Hebrew name, but no, it was Henry. Uh, First thing he told him to do was stop drinking Pepsi. He said, if you knew what that did to your body, you wouldn't drink it. And that's why I drink Coke. So, so he, he expected to wake up and find himself still cuffed to the guards in the cell and obliged to face whatever the morning was going to hold. But this was a good dream, and it wasn't over yet. Verse 10, they go past guard post one. They go past guard post number two. He doesn't say they're asleep. It says that Peter just walked out. And I mean, how much cooler is that anyway? No wonder Peter expected this to be a vision because if these guards are actually awake and doing their jobs, why are they letting me get up and walk out of a prison? Why aren't they noticing that the doors are opening? But Peter is physically leaving the building. And for some reason, they're not doing anything about it. So that's the kind of stuff that usually happens in a dream. I can see why Peter thought it was a dream. There's a sister in our church and a brother I deeply miss. How many of you remember Brother Glenn Paulson? They used to smuggle contraband material into different countries in the world where the body of Christ needed resources. And I loved hearing the stories when they came back about big, huge suitcases filled with Bibles and Bible teaching aids and Christian Sunday school curriculum And they'd go in and they'd be singled out of the lineup at the airport. You, come over here by customs in some communist country. And they'd open up their suitcases and rifle through all the stuff and dig through the stuff. They'd take the Bibles out and thumb through the pages, put it all back in, close the suitcase and say, on your way. Do you think the Bible is just a story? Our sister and brother Glenn experienced the reality of this very kind of event many times over as they just walked in the path that the Lord was leading them to take materials into the suffering church. 
I think it's just spectacular. And so, so now they're walking uh, to the locked outer gate of the prison, and Peter's probably wondering, I wonder what's going to has the gate opens itself. And so he walks out, and they walk about a block, and Peter goes to turn to the angel and say, this is really, and he's standing there by himself. And he's just standing there. And then it says, in another moment of humanity, he finally realizes. <laughs> it took this long for him to realize that he was awake. Look to the person beside you and say, there's hope for you. <laughs> I don't know if Peter's dance. I don't, I don't know. Like, it's just, it's just, isn't this just the weirdest thing? Have you ever had a spiritual experience and you weren't sure whether it was real? Can I suggest to you that God does real things? And your natural mind will struggle to grasp onto what's really going on. But God does real things. And dare to believe that God can do real things for you. And so here's Peter now. He's standing. And I don't know if it's the, the, the cool air or what it is. But he realized, okay, I'm standing like one block in front of a jailbreak. I probably should not be standing here. <laughs> and so he has to pick a place to go. It says that... He goes to Mary's house. And Mary, by the way, is related to John Mark, who is, this is the first introduction of him, but we won't talk about him this morning. And so he goes to the prayer meeting. And he's got two things he needs to do. He needs to let the praying church know, first of all, that he's out, and then he needs to get out of Dodge. He's got to get out of there. And so he's standing outside the prison, and he realizes it's a bad idea. Off he goes. He's out of here. And it says he goes to the prayer meeting where many people were gathered where many people were gathered, and they were praying fervent prayers. Remember what James says, the fervent prayers of righteous people have tremendous impact. Don't forget that. And so he knocks on the door, and dear servant girl Rhoda answers the door. And, and so it's like, knock, knock. Who's there? It's Peter. Peter who? I don't know if I should tell this joke or not. Peter Pant, she was so excited. <laughs> she is so blown away that Peter's at the door that she leaves him standing out in the street and she runs back to the prayer meeting. Peter's here, Peter's here. And these faith-filled saints say what? You're out of your mind. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, there's hope for you. <laughs> They're praying. They've seen God do this before. And they don't believe it, that God's actually answered their prayer. And so Rhoda, God bless her soul, she goes, no, he's really there. No, you're crazy. No, he's really there. And she's sticking to her guns. And so they th then they say, well, maybe you did hear something. And now listen to this. Okay, turn to your neighbor and say, there's hope for you. <laughs> listen to this spiritualizing. We, we do this. We make up stuff. And so there, which is easier to believe? That God who has delivered Peter from multiple prisons has done it again or that it's the angel of Peter? I'm not sure what they were going for here, but the angel of Peter, who an angel who has to knock on the door to get in? An angel has to knock on the door? Okay, so this is their theory and they're sticking to it. But Rhoda is so insistent, they finally, I think just to get her to shut up, they go to the door. And guess what they find? <laughs> it's actually Peter. Turn to your neighbor one more time and say, do you think there's hope for me? <laughs> do you think there's hope for me? The humanity of this story is so funny. I could see this happening to a number of us in our church. How many of you can see that happening in our church? Wild, wild ideas and wild interpretations and just, we have no idea what's going on. Who would agree that most of the time when it comes to the Lord and the kingdom, I'm not sure I ever have much of an idea of what's really going on. And it seems like I'm groping through the darkness just trying to figure it out and just trying to get, just trying to understand, Lord, what, in, what are you doing? I don't even know what you're doing. Uh, it's probably not what you want to hear from your pastor, but... God is doing his thing. And Paul would write later that God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the wise. 
Not the things that are brilliant and noble, but the things in the people who are just like us, just normal people who mostly don't know what's going on, but God is supernaturally moving in their midst, and he is freeing them from prisons, and all kinds of amazing stuff is going on. So they actually go to the gate, and they find, and, and it says, here's these people who are praying with faith, you know, faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of not, things not seen, are looking at Peter, and they're actually amazed that God actually did it. <laughs> Have you ever been surprised when God actually answered one of your prayers? I have a good story about that too, but that's why sermons get long. <laughs> okay, okay, you drug it out of me. <laughs> no. All right. So, verse 18 and 19, there's another side of this wonderful miracle that's happened in the church, wonderful miracle of Peter being set free. And it's the aftermath of the miracle on the other side. Do you ever think about that? God does something for his people. What's the repercussion on the other side? This disturbance among the soldiers happened with great intensity. When they figure out that Peter's actually not there, they know the penalty for losing Peter. And the price of losing a prisoner in that generation was that the guard would suffer the penalty that the prisoner would have suffered. And so these guys know Little doubt these guards were looking for two things. Number one, they were looking for Peter. And number two, they were looking for somebody to pin the blame on. They were looking for somebody to pin the blame on. And eventually the news gets to Herod, who had big plans for the next day, as you recall, and now he's very disappointed and very angry. And so they interrogate the guards, but they can't produce their charge. Peter was gone, and all of the guards are executed at the hands of Herod. This idea that people in power don't always value the lives of the people that they rule is an oft-repeated theme in human history, isn't it? Life is cheap. They, they throw people like resources, like clay pigeons out into... And we just came through Remembrance Day, and I can't help but wonder, were all of the actions by the leaders sending men into battles... You know, were they thinking about the lives that would be lost? Or were they just looking at the big picture, the strategy, the big chessboard? Did they think about individual men, women being sent into battle? Herod doesn't really care about these people. These are his guards. These are his soldiers. In Isaiah 43, God says to his people, I will give others in place of you. I will give others in place of you. I find that to be a very sobering thought. But God's intervention saves Peter, though it costs the soldiers their lives. In verse 20, Herod leaves Judea and he goes to his other capital, Caesarea. Tyre and Sidon are on the Phoenician seaboard, and traditionally they'd been dependent on Galilee for food. Of course, Herod is r ruling Galilee, but Herod is angry with them. For some reason, he has made them mad. And so they're looking for a chance to suck up. And so, we, and this is such an interesting little passage that, that he includes. But Luke doesn't say very much, but Josephus, who is a historian, actually tells a rather lengthy version that actually completely aligns with what Luke says. So let me read what Josephus wrote about the events at the end of Acts, uh, uh, of Acts chapter 12. It says, Josephus gives this parallel account. At Caesarea, Agrippa initiates... Uh, a show of honor for Caesar. Of course, we know he's a good politician. Inaugurating this as a festival for the emperor's welfare. Large numbers of provincial officials and dignitaries attended. On the second day, he put on an ornate robe made of silver, intricate, beautiful. And at the break of day, he makes his grand appearance. And as the first rays of the sun come over the horizon, it hits this silver robe and it's like he's glowing with the light of the sun. Josephus describes this. And immediately, the people of Tyre and Sidon, who are trying to get back in his good books, oh, they begin to flatter him. Oh, aren't you something? Oh, aren't you something? And Herod just drinks it in. He, in his pride, he drinks it in. So he's resplendent, inspiring, intimidating. 
and they begin to cry out. And Josephus says, they said, be gracious unto us. Till now we have reverenced you as a man, but henceforth we acknowledge thee to be of more than mortal nature. Can everyone go, right? I mean, you can just, they're totally sucking up. However, Herod soaks in it. He loves it. And at the same time, it says, he was seized by severe pain in his belly, which began a most violent physical attack. He was carried to the palace, and after five days of continual suffering, he died. That's what Josephus, a historian, wrote. What do we read in the Scripture? And the people kept crying out, the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and died. Luke gives us a short version. Josephus gives us the ornate version, but they agree. In Romans 1.25, it says that people will exchange the truth of God for a lie, and they will worship and serve a creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Herod actually viewed himself as a god. <laughs> Pharaoh viewed himself as a god. Nebuchadnezzar viewed himself as a god. They installed themselves as deities, as objects of worship over their kingdoms and over their people. And God does not share his glory with anyone. Herod worships himself. Herod worships his position. He worships his power, his reputation, his status. And God won't tolerate this man anymore. God knows what he has done to James. He knows what he wants to do to Peter. And he knows all the things that he would do if he lets this guy live. And so he kills him. He judges him. And he dies. You know, when Saul, who was a tormentor of the church as well, was confronted on the road to Damascus, he was trying to please God. <laughs> and when he's confronted in his pride, in his arrogance, what does he do? He humbles himself. <laughs> And he actually recognized that Jesus is Lord. He humbles himself. He steps off of his high throne and he puts Jesus there. Herod is also a tormentor of the church, but he thinks there's no need for Jesus. There's no need for God. And so when he is confronted with the gospel, with Christianity, he tries to snuff it out. And he goes after the apostles. In his stubborn, selfish life, Heron thinks he doesn't need Jesus, but he's wrong. He died in his fancy robes, destroyed by something on the inside of him, and not just the worms, not just whatever it was that took his physical life. There was something inside of him as a person that was sick, that cost him his life. It was his pride. It was his idolatry of self. I wonder, I wonder, are any of us like this? Do you think that the world owes you? Do you think the world revolves around you? <laughs> How many of you learned that it definitely does not? The church doesn't revolve around any one of us. It revolves around Jesus, who is the head. It's his house. I love saying in the Father's house this morning. It's the Father's house. It's not your house. It's not my house. We didn't build it. Jesus will build his church. God says that we deserve something. He says the wages of sin is death. What we deserve, God sent his son and released his Holy Spirit and mobilized and empowered his people to do triage in this world, to go out and see if we could save some who were on the verge of the end of them. Herod had a chance. Didn't want it. Saul had a chance, and he took it. He would become Paul, and we're about to be introduced to him in the new year. We're going to see what God does in the Gentile world through the Apostle Paul. With this scene and warning, Luke concludes the epic adventures of Peter in the book of Acts. In chapter 13, we'll pick up the story of how God invades the Gentile world with the good news of Jesus. But Acts 12 reminds us 
that this world is full of Herods. But we have Jesus. I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know what's coming after you. I don't know where the pressures of life are coming at you today. But I want you to know that it doesn't matter how many Herods there are in the world. You and I, we have Jesus. You may feel like you're in a prison right now. It could be an emotional prison, a mental prison, a physical prison. And this world will imprison us. It's a, it's a hard place. It can be a difficult place. But we have Jesus. And if there's one thing I know that I need, it's this one thing. My little sister used to be, oh, she was so cute. And she sang this little wedding song. And the line of the song was, I could wish you promises. I could wish you uh, gold and silver and success and stuff. But then she says, but when I've wished you Jesus, I've wished you everything. How many of you know that little song? My little sister Donna used to sing that. Oh, she was cute as a button, little blonde ringlets. Oh, she's so cute. That's what I wish for you. Those words ring through my heart and my mind this morning. It doesn't matter what prison you're in. It doesn't matter what battle you're facing. I pray that you're at the prayer meeting. <laughs> but if you happen to be in the prison, we're praying for you. Who here needs the Lord to let them out of a prison? <laughs> There's a prison that you're in. Could be anything. Could be addictions. Could be physical challenges. Could be any number of things. But if you're here this morning and you're in a prison, I just want you to raise your hand. And we're just going to begin to pray for you. We prayed for each other at the beginning. Now we're going to pray for you. Heavenly Father, you can see people whose hands are up all over the sanctuary. They're in prisons. Lord, we have physical prisons. We have emotional prisons. We have history and past. We have trauma and wounding. And Lord, these things, they lock us up and they lock us down and they don't let us be free to be who you've made us to be. Lord, we had this beautiful illustration of little Claire and we just think of, a, of her life so beautifully <laughs> representing the potential of everything that somebody can be. And Lord, we were all once Claire <laughs> and this world's been hard on us. And here we find ourselves today chained in a prison. And so Lord, today we ask, angel of the Lord, Heavenly Father, would you come and meet us in our cells right now? We ask for it in the name of Jesus. If you want Jesus to come and meet you where you're at, just raise your hand. I want Jesus to come and meet me in my pain. Maybe you're carrying burdens for others. Maybe that's what keeps you awake at night. You're praying for your children. You're praying for your neighbors. You're praying for family members. I don't know what weight the world has put on you. I don't know what's come against you. But in the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray for the freedom that only God gives, that only God can bring. And so, Lord, right now we lay hold of your promise that you will always be with us. You'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us. And, Lord, we lift these things to you. We lift our chains to you. Break the chains off of your people, I pray, Lord. For people who are watching at home, I'm praying for you this morning that the Lord would break you free to be who and what God has called you to be. Lord, we ask for this this morning in the powerful name of Jesus who sets people free. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.